Hello, everyone. My name is Braden Banglin, and I'm a student discussion group coordinator and a member of the Student Advisory Board at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program. This spring series is presented in partnership with the Kansas Rural Center. Today's program is presented in partnership with KU Honors. Today's program will be live streamed and available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past Dole Institute programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. For virtual viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. Please ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your question with this in mind and just ask one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming Dole 2024 Spring Fellow and, Dis and Douglas County Commissioner, Karen Willey. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us for our second afternoon of our series, uh, Obstacles and Opportunities, Tackling Sustainability in Kansas. And I'm glad to be representing both the Dole Institute and the Kansas Rural Center. So last week, if you were here with us, we talked about the federal farm bill's impact on Kansas economy and ecology. And today we're going to explore some related issues of uh, the water quality and quantity in Kansas with our series, with our, our conversation, Sink or Swim, the Future of Water in Kansas. So no single issue controls the prosperity of our state like water. Um, we have an ever limited resource to balance the needs of agriculture, cities, wildlife, and industry. Please help me in welcoming two people who have been active voices in our Kansas water policy conversation, Representative Lindsey Vaughn and Representative Kenny Titus. So please take a minute, tell us about your background, how you ended up in the state legislature, and what your, why water policy is important to you. Lindsey, do you want to start? Sure, I can get started. Uh, thank you, Karen, for having us here today. Um, this is an issue that I really care about and I'm excited to be here uh, and to talk about with you all. So in terms of why I um, really got involved in politics and, and ultimately ran, um, kind of goes back to 2016, which is actually the year I graduated college. I went to UNC Chapel Hill. And even though I studied political science, I didn't necessarily have aspirations to ever run for office. And part of that was because I didn't really see myself in my elected officials. So um, 2016, uh, especially with the presidential election, I felt was feeling relatively powerless. And so I wanted to come home and get really involved locally. So I got really involved with uh, our local chapter of the Young Democrats, um, became really informed about campaigns, um, worked as a field organizer on Representative Sharice David's first campaign for Congress, and then um, had the chance to, to come to the Capitol and, and tour the Capitol for an advocacy day, was on the House floor and looked out and was really shocked by the lack of representation of young people and young women in particular. And so that really lit a fire under me to get involved and to run for office, which is what I did in 2020. Um, so I'm really excited to be serving in my second term currently. And then why water policy? It was a committee that I got put on my first year and Originally, um, it was something I was interested in. I thought it was in, in a great opportunity to get involved with what I felt was potentially a bipartisan environmental issue, um, and especially as a young person looking at environmental issues and the impact that um, you know, climate change has on my generation and future generations and trying to mitigate and adapt to that is really important to me. So that's why I got involved originally, but after being on the committee, it became clear how, it, you know, for me, it wasn't just about advocating for the environment. It was about the relationships that I built in Western Kansas and the people that I met and the bridge that that created, I think, um, for me, between, you know, the Eastern and Western part of the state and rural and urban and old and young and Democratic and Republican. And it really became this opportunity to bring people together and to work on something that's fundamental to the future of our state. And so, it's, it's been a huge honor to be involved with this issue, and I'm excited to work with folks like Representative Titus 
um, to keep making progress for our generations and for future generations. Yeah. Yeah, so grew up out in Great Bend, which is kind of a unique uh, ecosystem for water. It sits in between Quivira National Wildlife Refuge and Cheyenne Bottoms. Um, my family was a farming family, and we had some irrigated ground uh, in Barton County. So um, I was around water. It was an important part of the, the economy, and, and we're not farmers anymore. But um, So it was something I was always familiar with. Um, I ended up going to K-State, where I majored in journalism. I also have an MA in history from K-State. And then I actually spent several years as a news and sports broadcaster at, at various radio stations uh, across the state. I've even done some Lawrence High games on KLWN here when I was in law school to pay for uh, pencils and whatever law students buy, you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, as I was in law school, I got into uh, Professor John Peck, who's since retired, um, got into his water law class and, and started looking at some of the issues, and I was just I was fascinated with it. There were some things that had happened around Great Bend that were really important to water law. And you know, I, I could read some of those old cases and notes, and I, I know the family names and had seen them down at the local Elks Lodge and thought, this is a really, this is a really neat area of law. And so um, I was less interested in, you know, setting bail and criminal prosecution. And so I sort of got into this, and in Kansas, it's really a niche area. There's, you know, a handful of lawyers that really know water law, but unlike other Western states, we're not super litigious among ourselves, so it's, it's not necessarily the easiest way to make a living when you hang out your shingles. So uh, I went into public service out of law school. I worked for the Department of Transportation. I worked for Attorney General Derek Schmidt. That's where I kind of got my first break into water. I, I worked on some interstate compact stuff with the Kansas Water Office. And then Department of Agriculture came and recruited me out of Derek Schmidt's office after about six months because they were looking for a water attorney. And so I got to spend six years um, there, and that's where all the action is. Um, Division of Water Resources handles almost all the regulation when it comes to water quantity issues. So I just got, I was in the best place in the state to, to learn water law and experience it. So that, that's how I became interested in water and, and have really enjoyed working in it. As far as the politics side, I've always been a little bit interested in politics, but um, when we transitioned from, so I was, Governor Brownback was still governor when I was hired as chief counsel at the Department of Agriculture and worked two years under him and Governor Collier. And then when we got our new secretary at the Department of Agriculture with Governor Kelly, um, we were the last agency to find out who our secretary was. And we found out the Friday before the Monday inauguration who our new boss was. And of course, by that time, all the assistant and deputy secretaries had left, and I was the highest ranking person left on the legislative team. So the new secretary said, here's the objectives. We'll see you in Topeka on Monday. Get to work. Um, and I had only been behind. I had worked on drafting bills, of course, but I had, had only been behind the scenes. So I got to spend four years um, through that process and a little bit of luck. I developed a good relationship. My predecessor in, in District 51 is, uh, was Representative Ron Hyland, and he had pushed a big water bill his last term. And we'd become close and work together, and, and he had encouraged me to run when he retired. So uh, that's kind of how I got, got into this. I'm in my first term, so um, yeah, it's been good. So I had some conversations with both of you before this. Uh, can you talk over the, the key issues that the state has identified and how those fit into the geography of the state? So water quality and quantity issues. Mm -hmm. I, I can tackle the first if you want to tackle okay. the second. Um, so as it's outlined in the Kansas Water Plan, which is a plan that's updated every five years um, through a process set out by the Water Office, which includes um, bringing in folks from regional advisory committees and um, getting local input to determine what are the, the most important water quality and quantity concerns across the entire state of Kansas. And the five that have been identified include um, the unsustainable depletion of the aquifer, include uh, water quality concerns across the state, both groundwater and surface water, um, sedimentation of our reservoirs across the state, it, um, extreme weather events, so the impacts of climate change and how that affects other um, water quality and quantity concerns throughout Kansas, and then uh, I believe the fifth was educating the public about our water resources. Yeah, and we'll get to dig into many of those. Uh, last year, I believe you were both involved with some landmark legislation to fund the state water plan. Um, tell us about those bills and how they came about. So those bills really started 
two years ago in the, in the previous legislative session, there was a very large bill that was put together when the Water Committee was sort of reconvened after a little bit of an absence in existence. And there were pieces of that bill that were popular. There were pieces that met some resistance. The consolidation of their various agencies into one water agency was less popular than some of the other pieces. But that bill was important because it really raised the profile of water and there had been some conversation, but it just wasn't registering across the state. And although, as oftentimes happens in the Capitol, that bill was a failure on its face, it really lit a fire under a lot of folks and water became an important issue. And so when Lindsay came back to Water Committee and I came in and, and Representative Blex from Southeast Kansas also ha was involved in this, we, we kind of came together and said, let's, let's look at the pieces that were the most important or the most popular from that bill. And it was the groundwater management district accountability to deal with the clients in the Ogallala and the funding piece. And so we kind of all worked together and, and, and built a plan. Um, the funding piece, it was a little bit unique um, we increased funding, um, the state general funds had been about $8 million a year is what was required when it was delivered. And we increased that to $35 million. But to just drop in $35 million to an administrative agency, some of you may trust agencies more than I do, having been inside one, but um, it, that's a lot of money. Our to, agencies to, are great, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a lot of money to spend all at once. And so we wanted to put some guardrails in, on it. And, and part of that also was bringing in more people into that water conversation. So half that new money is, is now dedicated to, to help municipal infrastructure with an emphasis on small towns. And some of this comes from, I have a, a district that I call it kind of a bridge district, but you know I have Manhattan on one side, it's 6A High School, 60,000 people, all the way down to this, you know, eight-man football down in Eskridge in the southeast corner of, of Wabunsee County. So I have all these, these different interests. And what I would hear from my smallest towns is, well, we can't even afford, yeah, there's this federal money out there that's free, more or less, but we can't even afford to hire the engineer to get the plans to apply for that free federal money. So we need help with that. So we set up a plan to help with technical assistance. Then there's a piece to help with matching funds or some loan forgiveness, and, and there are various factors that we put into that. But once you expand those things into the water plan fund, you had, we had 50 some municipalities that came and testified in favor of our bill. Um, the Kansas Contractors Association was supportive. Um, that's a group that, that, that is important in Topeka. So we brought in these other groups that hadn't really played in water. And I've heard some legislators say that they think we caught leadership a little bit by surprise at how popular this bill was, because um, it showed up and people, I know the Speaker of the House said, every time I go give a speech somewhere, I talk about our talking points, and then people want to ask me about water. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's great, and, and that means people are paying attention, and it's good. So, um, but yeah, it was a lot of work, a lot of patience, and we found some, some good ideas, and we were able to push forward. Representative Bond, do you want to add anything to that? It's a more urban representative. Yeah, and um, so Kenny talked a lot about the funding bill, so I can dive in a little bit to the other piece of legislation that we worked on which was House Bill 2279. And the goal with that, as Kenny said, was we have our groundwater management districts across the western part of the state, and they largely overlie the majority of the aquifer. So we have five districts. Um, the three districts that are in the most western part of the state are four in the northwest corner, uh, one which is in kind of like the western central part of the state, and then three which is in the southwestern part of the state. Um, and then five is um, like, South Central, and then two is um, outside of, to the um, west of Wichita. So we have five districts, and the goal of this bill was to um, make sure that they're really all planning for the future. So all these districts were already required to have a management program, but there weren't really any requirements in state law about what those, pro that those management programs had to look like. So this bill um, requires that all the groundwater management districts identify their priority areas of concern, so any areas with 50 years of usable lifetime remaining in the groundwater or less have to be a priority area, and any area with groundwater quality concerns have to be a priority area. So they have to identify those areas and then use local input to actually come up with real action plans to address them. So in my mind, it's, it's the first step that we've really taken to require strategic management of the resource and um, to, to put on paper 
what these priority areas are and what we're gonna do about it. So for me, that was a huge step forward in, in really being able to manage the aquifer. And you know, I think we have a lot more to do, but I think that was a, a really positive step in the right direction. So in many Western states, you'd mentioned that you know, water rights are determined through litigation. Uh, what are some of the active cases that are going on in Kansas, and why, why aren't there more of those? What are they accomplishing? I leave this to the attorney. So I, <laughs> I don't believe we have maybe one active case in the transfer as far as actual litigation. Mm -hmm. Everything else is fair. We're even friendly with our neighboring states in the, in the compact. So um, my goal as an attorney was always to be the downstream state getting sued so that we had all the water instead of trying to get it, but, or the upstream state, but that didn't happen while I was at KDA. We're keeping an eye on Oklahoma though, I think. Um, but you know, the, so Kansas is kind of unique when it comes to how we have the Western water law system, but we didn't start out that way. For, so originally the, this part of the state, right, was settled first. It's wet, it matches the Eastern part of the United States. We adopted riparian law out of the gate, and that's a, it's, it's a common law system. Basically, we're all gonna manage this resource together and share, you get some rights, and when there's not enough, you, you find ways to, to make it work. It, it, share and share alike is sort of the gist of that system, and when you always have enough water, four out of five years you have enough water, that works out pretty well. But as settlers move west, they realize, oh, there's not enough water every year, especially in surface water. So, uh, we ultimately tried a couple attempts to put in this prior appropriation system. Around 1945, we, we adopt the, our, our current Water Appropriation Act, and um, we give priority uh, of use so the oldest water rights get to use their, their right first, and that applies um, to all, all water in Kansas, surface water, groundwater, uh, whether it can be connected, sometimes it's not. Other states, there's a lot of different models of how you do that. But in the places where we don't have enough water, most of the development has been groundwater. And suing over groundwater, unless it's directly connected to a stream, is, is time consuming and expensive. So there's enough geologists in here, you can find one after and they can explain it to you. But to figure out the exact impact of one well on another well, and it's all happening underground, uh, it's, it's technical work. And if you don't have the money to buy an engineer to prove it and, and spend all the lawyer hours, it's tough. So you have that difficulty, whereas in Colorado or you know, Wyoming, these other states, yeah, they have groundwater, but there's so much more surface water and so much more important with Bureau of Reclamation developments, things like that, that it just went into litigation sooner. Uh, the other thing is, once you start suing your neighbors to turn off water rights, there's an immense amount of pressure in your community. Uh, we had a case, it's about 10 years ago, it all started in, in Southwest Kansas with a vested water right and uh, the owner of that water right has given a number of, of interviews and public talks, but he came under immense pressure from his neighbors. And it was also very expensive, and at the end of the day, you know, he, he maybe didn't get the best outcome by going to litigation. So um, we've seen a couple other areas, too, where when we have a large area of groundwater that's impacted, Kansas, I, we're polite, I guess it's that Midwestern niceness. We, we, there's an aversion to just going straight to litigation when we can all cut back a little bit, and we'll probably talk about Walnut Creek and Quivira later, but when, when you can all cut back a little bit and everybody keeps their water rights, there's economics at play in that too. So um, that's why there's not much litigation in Kansas. It's kind of a complex question, and as you talk to the guys that have, have looked at water law for a long time, everyone says, well, we've just been waiting. When the groundwater gets low enough, eventually the litigations will start. And for the most part, they haven't yet. You, now, I, I would say just anecdotally from being at the department, um, rules and regulations matter more. People push back on why you're making decisions. So on the administrative side of things, it's not necessarily going all the way litigation, but people are paying more attention to why you make decisions. They're more likely to challenge them if you don't have the explicit regulation laid out of how you make these decisions, um, then you can kind of get pushback on it. So. Um, but we, we could see, you know, if, if we don't look at our reservoir problem, I don't know that we've spent a lot of time thinking about it, but if we lose enough reservoir capacity, there will be shortages in the eastern part of the state. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point, that, that will result in what looks like more traditional water litigation, I think. So in talking about reservoirs, which is where I was headed next, um, according to the Corps of Engineers, Kansas federal reservoirs were designed with about a 75-year lifespan. So it's not surprising that we're having some sedimentation issues across the state. Um, are there particular reservoirs that are more impacted than others, and what's being done? Yeah, so um, 
you all may have heard about the dredging of John Redmond. That's been one that's uh, been fairly well known where the power plant was going in by the reservoir. They needed to make sure they had enough water for cooling purposes. And so they decided to manually dredge the reservoir, which what we just finished um, last year paying off that um, bond or um, whatever we used in order to, to pay for that dredging. But it was extremely expensive, and in the long term, it's not sustainable because you do it once, it fills back up with sediment, you have to do it again, you have to find a place to put all of that um, sludge or you know sediment. And so we have been looking for a longer term solution in order to address this. And um, more recently, the reservoir that's been of greatest concern is Tuttle Creek Reservoir, where about 50% of that reservoir right now is filled with sediment, which creates major issues in the long term for uh, water supply and uh, resiliency in our communities. So our legislature last year fully funded um, what's called a water injection dredge pilot project in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineer, e Engineers that will allow us to use this water injection dredge, which has been used in harbors, but never in an inland dam, um, to actually pilot it. Um, and what that will do is essentially uh, inject water into the bottom of the dam and create a density current with the sediment. And the idea is that it will then flow out the bottom of the dam. So this would hypothetically create a long-term solution for our dams that, have th that are built in that way with the uh, inlet um, uh, releases at the bottom of the dam. Um, but they also want to study it because there are questions about the downstream effects on water quality and ecosystems and things like that. So it's being studied, but it's thought that this could potentially be a longer term and more sustainable solution to sedimentation in our reservoirs. Uh, and then part of that, too, is addressing the causes of sedimentation. So we do stream bank stabilization um, in, in multiple departments, and I think there are other ways that we can stabilize our stream banks. But um, that's one of the big ones. And then I don't know, are there others? Off the top of your head? There are a couple of, not every reservoir has the gates at the right level. I think there are two or three others that you could possibly, if it's successful, that, that we could use this on. So it's not a, it's not a fix all. It will, it will fix a couple of problems. But, um, you know, Tuttle has a particularly high sedimentation rate compared to some of the others. I think it's lost almost 45% of its capacity or something mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, for, for this water area, right, for the Kansas River, that's, that's a critical project. And it would be great for this area all the way to Kansas City. If, if we're successful there. And that uh, John Redmond was next to the, it's the nuclear power plant that is yes. you know, in, in need of the cooling mm -hmm. need there. Um, you're talking about the blue-green algae problem in reservoirs. Um, what causes it? And what does that mean for our recreation and drinking water? What options do we have? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm getting the, the nod yeah. to take this one. So um, I'll, yeah, I can start. So I think when we talk about reservoirs with the harmful algal bloom problem, Milford is probably the reservoir we have this issue the most. Uh, a lot of it is caused by non-point source pollution or runoff from agricultural properties, so um, herbicides, pesticides, uh, all those sorts of things that um, you know end up um, going downstream and into the reservoir, and it creates these algal blooms. Um, the primary chemical that causes them is phosphates, so that's what's getting into these reservoirs. And it does create um, concerns for the health of humans and wildlife and also dogs, um, pets, things like that. So it's definitely something we want to address. Um, I think part of that, they have implemented uh, programs in partnership with the federal government, uh, including the RCCP. I believe that's and what that stands for. I'm going to have to phone a friend. Uh, but that works with landowners upstream to implement best soil health practices so that it reduces the amount of non-point source pollution runoff that is causing uh, the harmful algal blooms in Milford Reservoir specifically. So working with landowners, uh, helping them, uh, and incentivizing them to implement these practices are some of the things that are being done to reduce the amount of phosphate runoff that's causing some of these algal blooms. Presumptized, do you want to take any of that? Okay. That's uh, so moving back to aquifers, so the, the, the drawdown on the high plains, Ogallala aquifers, critical implications for agriculture in rural communities in western Kansas. Um, how is that tied to the agricultural economy in western Kansas, that access to that water? So we've really built a value-added economy over time in the western part of the, of the state. It started with, you know, we were growing wheat, and that, that makes sense. Then as irrigation develops, you can grow corn. 
right? Basic economics, you make more money growing corn than you can wheat. But over time, it's the value-added products that, that really make the economy boom out there. So, well, you grow the corn, right? You're going to feed it to cattle. We're going to turn the cattle into steaks. Value-added, turn the corn into ethanol, and all, all the way up the line. And then you have all the industries that develop, you know, their industries supporting the irrigation itself. They're all the, the fertilizer and the seed dealers. But, but then you look at all the other services, right? When, when you have the, the packing plants and the ethanol plants, and, and you know, the implement dealerships and the hotels and the restaurants. And it's, it's a vast economic web that's all built on the water that grows the corn. And you can't just pull that out because if you, if you say, OK, we have to preserve our water. We're not going to produce the corn. Well, now the feedlots have to pay more to bring in feed from outside the area. And, and those, those costs trickle all the way up. You know, to what point is a breaking point at any given point in the chain? They, uh, I'm not an economist, but, but you can see the scale of th that we've set up. And, and so we've really, we've really built on all these layers. And so we, we have to be careful. You can't just, just go in with a sledgehammer and say, we've got to cut use because it'll have impacts. And if you have any doubts about what that does to a community, look at where they've dried up canals in southeast Colorado. So the front range is growing. They'll go into these, their entire counties now that have, I think if you look at them on the map, it just looks like desert instead of prairie anymore when it used to be irrigated land. They sell it, sell their water rights, their canal rights to, to municipalities in Denver and Colorado Springs, wherever. And then the econ they, they can't grow anything, right? Now, Southeast Colorado is a particularly hostile terrain. There are places in Kansas where you could dry land farm, but if you don't pull that water out very carefully, you end up with the desert in a lot of areas. And then there's, 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 no, there's no implement dealership, there's no school, there's no restaurant, there's no barber. And it really, it's, it's just sad, right? You, you've all seen those, those pictures of, of places like that. So um, that, now that's a worst case scenario, right? And, and that was surface water driven, that, that wasn't groundwater driven. So we have a, a different situation in Kansas, but you know the, these communities are, are built up uh, around water use, and so we have to be be careful and, and respectful when, when we deal with them. Yeah, and if I can add to that, and, um, you know, I, I don't think this is what Kenny's saying, but I also want to caution that, you know, conservation and economic deterioration are not the same. Like, I think that's also a false dichotomy um, in terms of, you know, we can conserve water and also, um, and, and do it in a way that doesn't hurt local economies. And, so, you know, we see the case of Dr. Bill Golden in Sheridan 6, which is Sheridan County in Northwest Kansas, where he studied this group of farmers who implemented what's called a local enhanced management area, which is basically community-based conservation. They all come together, they agree to use less, and he studied the outcome of that. And he found that because of increased efficiencies and decreased input costs, when they were conserving the water, they were actually able to increase their cash flows. Their produ overall production was less, yes, but it wasn't hurting their pocketbooks. And so I think there's a balance where we don't want to go in and make sweeping changes that, you know, drastically impact these communities. But at the same time, we need this water in the long term and for future generations. And we have to think in a long term way. And I think we can do it in a way that doesn't negatively impact communities, um, but brings folks together and can conserve the resource in the long term. As Representative Vaughn, you had also talked about um, the groundwater management districts, and you, that was a success probably story there. What are some of the frustrations mm -hmm. also, and um, whose voices need to be involved in those? Yeah, and I think this is definitely something we can both speak to. I think um, Sheridan 6, which is in groundwater management district 4, that's a, that's a huge success story. They've seen close to a 30% reduction in their water use, which is reaching sustainability in that region. So, I mean, and the fact that they've been able to do that while increasing their cash flow or, um, you know, very marginally uh, impacting or, or hurting the economy in that area is a really big deal. And so that is a, is a huge success story. And then uh, across the entire groundwater management district in GMB4, they've implemented a district-wide LEMA. So now, you know, Sheridan 6 was the success story, and now the entire groundwater management district is encompassed in these, it's a local enhanced management area, or a, um, as I was mentioning, a community-based conservation effort. So they all agree to use less water 
uh, for the community benefit. And so GMD4 now has this district-wide Lima. GMD1 now has a district-wide Lima. Uh, so we see this catching on in the western part of the state where they see kind of the benefits of conservation and of coming together to do that. So those are, I think, two or um, three really great success stories. And also in Wichita County in GMD1, they are approaching 25 to 30% um, water savings as well and their reduced use. So that's another great success story of you know, Wichita County, people in that community coming together saying, we want to use less water, um, initially entering into a voluntary agreement, and then getting a local enhanced management area in place, and then mobilizing the rest of their district to, to also do that. And it's, for me, it's really inspiring to see these, local, th these small communities, whether it's Sheridan 6 or Sheridan County, Wichita County, you know, for those communities to come together, say, we want to do things differently, to make that change and then to inspire the rest of their district to, to also make those changes. I think, for me, that's been really encouraging in terms of our future management of the resource and the local willingness to actually make changes. So the, the city of Hayes is also um, putting in some unique changes for, for their uh, municipal water supply. Can either of you address that? Again, let me just to add on the groundwater districts. It's important to remember you know, when they were created, the environment was a lot different. Um, so the chief engineer at that time was hesitant to uh, really stop development of wells. And, and to one extent, that's what the law in Kansas says, is develop as much water as, as you think you can uh, with some safeguards. And so when they were put in place, there weren't very many safeguards being used at the state level. And so the initial 10 or 20 years of the districts was they did a relatively good job. It, they, they took what I call the low-hanging fruit, right? They, they required meters on, on wells before they were required statewide. They put in well spacing rules so you didn't overdevelop. And, and they, did, they did good things out of the gate. What's happened is, though, as we've seen a more proactive role at the state level, um, the, the, easy, the easy things you can do aren't, aren't there anymore. And so now it comes down to neighbor has to cut neighbor's water use. And that's where in, you know, these, these communities have the same complex relationships that every local community and board has. Sometimes it's hard to regulate your neighbor. And, and that's sort of the point where we've gotten and, and what we're trying to balance that local control but give them enough guidance from the state level to, to try and help them get to that next level of conservation. Um, as far as the city of Hayes and their water supply, Hayes is in a, in a tough spot because they don't have much groundwater. They, they've been a, a surface water community and, and the surrounding alluvium, but uh, they continue to grow. So I, I think if you look at your various sort of regional hubs is how I would describe them in western Kansas, populations declining across the area. But what you're seeing is people come in from the outlying areas and, and they're moving into Hayes and Garden City and Liberal. And if you, just, if you haven't been to one of those places for 10 or 20 years, you go out and see the commercial development, it's pretty obvious that, that that's just sort of naturally happening. And, and so they, they're growing. Um, and, and those communities don't always have the water supply. Hayes is in a particularly difficult spot because they're not over the Ogallala. Uh, they're, they're just on the fringes of it. So, you know, they have explored a lot of options over the last 30 years. They've looked at Wilson Lake. They've looked at, at Cedar Bluff. And, and that, that's not a viable option. So they decided their best option was to go south, about 60 miles down around Kinsley. They bought a, a ranch that had never been particularly profitable, as I understand it. It was very sandy. They grew alfalfa, took a lot of water to make it work. So they, they bought this ranch out. And what they've done is they've, they've slowly kind of turned, uh, retired the water rights from active agricultural use. And they want to now take what, what were these large irrigation wells and pump the water up to the city of Hayes. It's a monumental investment for them. And they just got uh, approved here in the last month. There's a, an administrative process. Um, that it's uh, the Water Transfer Act, and they went before uh, an administrative hearing officer. I believe they're, they're getting final review of that order now. It may likely be litigated uh, when that's all said and done, because people don't like moving water that far from, from where they are. Um, but, but there are a lot of safeguards in place, and, and Hayes does deserve credit um, as far as realizing they had to save water, they were very proactive very early. So they have an intensive groundwater management area in the city limits. Um, 
you know, they have rules about when you can wash your car, there are no private wells in the city, um, and when you do, do laundry, how much you use. And I don't have the per capita numbers at my fingertips, but, but Hayes is significantly below the, the state average. I think they're like, for, for where I am in, in Pottawatomie County, they use like a third of the average city where I'm at. So um, they've done a good job. They've been very responsible because they have no choice. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes that's when uh, Representative Blex, who, who helped push through the big water bills, always joked the best time to make water laws in the middle of a drought. So um, there is some, so, you know, we don't ever want a drought, but there, there is some truth to that. And, and they've been responsible and, and they've spent a lot of money to go through the process. And, and Division of Water Resource, the chief engineer, will ensure that they're not harming the area the water's leaving. Um, and so, but it, it's been contentious. And, and that's typical for most Western states. When you get these it, it's inner basin transfers, what it would be called, people just don't like seeing what they consider their water, whether that's right or wrong, going, going to someone else. And, and so there, there's been a lot of resistance along those lines there. Representative Bond, I wonder if you'd take this next one. Um, the city of Lakin has also had some mm -hmm. unique uh, situations there in terms of you know, the, the Arkansas River, which flows very nicely and is great whitewater rafting in Colorado and is almost dry or can mm -hmm. be dry for large stretches of the, in Kansas. Can you yeah. talk about their situation? Yeah, definitely. So it's kind of striking when you go out to Garden City and you're looking uh, at what should be the Ark River, it's completely dry. Um, you can walk down <laughs> on the riverbed, you can, you know, a lot of people take their ATVs out and go drive down the river. Um, but it, I mean, it's the first time that I've ever seen a dry river like that. And, and so the Ark River comes from Colorado. Um, there is an interstate compact, so they have to release so much of their flows from their reservoirs on an annual basis. Um, but most of that, as I understand it, just sinks into the groundwater. So instead of continuing to flow down the river, it sinks into the groundwater. And, the reason that's an issue, um, aside from the lack of flow of the river, are water quality concerns. So right now, coming down the arc, there, um, I think it's, it's naturally occurring leaching shales that are leaching uranium into the water supply. So you have uranium coming down the Colorado River, or the Arc River, I'm sorry, the Arc River, and it's leaching into the groundwater supplies of Garden City in southwest Kansas. So, you know, what is largely used for agriculture in that area is also used by cities. So you have cities that are trying to have a public water supply system um, that has now been contaminated by uranium uh, to, to really unsafe levels. So in Lake in Kansas, uh, their solution was to implement a nanofiltration plant. So they have a, a really state-of-the-art $6 million water treatment plant in order to, to use reverse osmosis to get this uranium out of the water. And so as we see, there's this um, interrelationship of quantity and quality as well. When we reduce the quality of water coming down the river, it's impacting quantity also and because it's not flushing that through the system. It's just going into the groundwater. So uh, that's what they've done in Lakin. There have been discussions about Deerfield linking up with Lakin water because they're also now having uranium contamination issues. So there are are much broader concerns um, that I think Lakin kind of emphasizes for the future of the western part of the state. And we talk about how we don't have ongoing litigation right now, and I don't uh, foresee that in this instance, and our, our compacts are related to, to quantity, as I understand it, and not quality. But we have been working really closely with our counterparts in Colorado, especially at an agency level, uh, to try and find ways that are mutually agreeable to reduce this uranium in the water supply for um, you know, for folks in the western part of the state, but then also for folks in eastern Colorado who are using that water as well. So that has been a great example of interstate cooperation trying to, to get this addressed because it, it's a big health concern for southwest Kansas. So if you'll help me tie our conversation to the rest of this series uh, we've got the Farm Bill, Energy and Climate, and starting with the Farm Bill, um, I don't expect you to be federal policy experts. Uh, none of us are, actually. Um, but, but if you can you tie our conversations about you know, sedimentation, non-point source pollution, um, aquifer depletion, back to federal policy for the Farm Bill? So what you have with the Farm Bill is a, a number of conservation programs that, that are funded federally. And so you probably have heard people throw around CRP, right, Conservation Reserve Program, which basically if, if you're a farmer, you're, you're given a payment and you put your land back into natural grassland type pasture, you can usually 
graze cattle on it, um, but you're not doing any production agriculture w with crops on it. You, you sign a, a contract for a certain number of years. You may renew it, you may not. There's a, a, most of that is, I would guess, you know, it, a, a good chunk of it's federal funding. We put a little state money on top of that to try and, and sweeten the pot. And then there are these various other programs. There's the CREP program, C-R-E-P, Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. And the goal of that program is to retire water rights. So we have several areas in the state. You develop a state plan, and, and then the feds approve it through USDA, NRCS. And you locate areas where you probably have like marginal soils, but it's productive because you've been able to put water rights on it. So there, there are areas in southwest Kansas, for example, a Sand Hill area south of Garden City that would, would never be productive without the water rights on them other than its natural grassland. And so um, you put money on those to buy out the water rights, and we, we retire the water rights, and then you get your payments, and then you transition it back into, into pasture land. Some of those, then there are various other programs that call equip, uh, and we have some state level programs to help as well. But the, the rub with those programs, I think, has always been that sometimes the, the people in DC are, are well intentioned, but they don't understand the issues of, well, I can't afford to, to stop irrigated production on this land and transition it back to, to pasture land. And the, the payment doesn't make it worthwhile, even if you think it's the right thing to do. And so we even ran into some of this. There was a, a cooperative effort on the Republican River Compact that we worked on to, because Colorado, as part of their compact compliance on the Lower Republican, had to, they had agreed to retire a number of acre feet of water from production or dry up a number of acres. But the problem is making the math work. They didn't want to go in and just take the water rights away, right? If, if push came to shove, they had the authority to do that to comply with the compact. But that's not really a very good solution for, for anybody involved. But the feds, at the same time, they didn't want to take the water right away and then let dry land farming continue or reduced irrigation farming continue because they don't, the, the folks that were viewing that just didn't see it as, as consistent with what they wanted to achieve. But if you're on our end, it also is stopping us from productive solutions, right? And, and transition programs and things like that. So um, the other thing that the feds have struggled to catch up with, and some of this is sort of great, Great Plains, you know, uh, local. But how do we get crop insurance for reduced irrigation? Because, yeah. and I'm certainly no expert on crop insurance, but you have these yields and they're based on, well, you put the water on, you should grow this much, and this is sort of the average bushels and price and all of that. But I, it doesn't make, they don't want to, if they know you're going to use two thirds of the water that you could use, then the insurance policy doesn't work without a special insurance policy, and you, and you can't make your numbers. And that's grossly oversimplified. But we have trouble getting these things through to the feds and making changes. And, and there was one example with the, the CREP program. We had actually gotten in a provision to allow dry land farming after you use CREP um, through our congressional delegations, and the, the states worked on it. And then USDA spent that whole farm bill period basically refusing until the very end to implement it because they, the, the people in charge of the program didn't like, they thought that was just, even though it was explicitly in the law, they didn't think it was consistent with what the program was supposed to be used for, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't put out rules and allow states to use it. So um, there are some tensions there in the Farm Bill where there are programs that can be used, but it's being able to leverage them in the ways that are helpful to our specific water circumstances um, can be a challenge sometimes. President Vaughn, do you want to add anything? Conservation uh, programs in the Farm Bill are fairly small overall compared to uh, commodity crops. Mm -hmm. Do you see any impact there to water in Kansas? Um, if I, to be totally honest, I think Representative Titus did a great job covering it. I don't okay. know uh, if I know much more than he does. Sure. So. Uh, so Kansas is an energy producing state. We have oil and gas, um, wind, possibly solar, even mm -hmm. conversations about hydrogen. Um, I know lumping those all together, they're very different. Can you pull any stories out of that for uh, implications on water and water sources? Yeah, um, I can get started on that one. So um, I think in terms of oil and gas, like we have seen a number of impacts on water quality. Um, I mean, the key example in Kansas is the Burton chloride plume. So there's a massive um, chloride plume that is northwest of the city of Wichita um, that was caused by old oil and gas operations that weren't properly contained and uh, ended up leaking brine into the groundwater supplies. So 
you now have this big plume that is actually moving towards the city of Wichita, which creates a massive concern for them because they need, they use that groundwater supply for drinking water. So um, in partnership with the state, they're talking about options for full scale remediation of that project, but that's, you know, 19, 20 million dollars and um, something that we'll have to do in the long term. Um, you know, so that's one impact uh, potentially in terms of groundwater quality. Um, you know, personally, I also have concerns about fracking, uh, mostly because it complete, as, as far as I know, it completely takes the water out of the water cycle. So this water is injected into the earth um, in order to release those uh, gases, and I'm not a, not a geological expert here, but um, in doing that, it, it puts the water um, in, into the earth and, and takes it out of the water cycle. So, um, you know, not only is that not a clean energy source, but it's also removing water in a, uh, uh, you know, that could otherwise be used for drinking water or, or other important um, other important things. I think um, on the clean energy side, one thing that's kind of come up in Kansas that we're currently in conversation about in terms of renewables is green hydrogen. And I think Kansas has a lot of potential for green hydrogen with our salt caverns and the infrastructure that we have currently. Uh, but part of the conversation is that with green hydrogen, you make hydrogen using electrolysis by breaking down water particles. So uh, it doesn't remove water from the water cycle because you have electrolysis, um, and then when the hydrogen is burned, it creates water. But the issue is you're taking it from one place and moving it to another. So I think when we have these discussions about green hydrogen, which are, I think, beneficial because you open up the, the, the door to being able to store renewable energies, for example, um, which is something we haven't been able to do in the past. But I think we have to be really careful about where we have those operations. You know, is putting um, a green hydrogen plant in Western Kansas, is that, is that the right thing to do? I don't know. So I think when we talk about green hydrogen, that's one thing to consider in terms of water is, you know, where, where do we want those operations to exist if, if that does come to Kansas and, um, you know, where do they end up, all those sorts of things. Very quickly, any, any detrimental impacts that you know of from wind and solar to water? So I don't know directly, and I, I'm, I don't know that we're positioned to answer that very well, but I, I think it's interesting because this is, this is a really key question, I think, long term. So I, living in the Flint Hills, windmills are off the table for the, because there's a, there's a moratorium. And I know you guys have had solar companies looking around this area that it's it caused a little bit of stir, at least among some people. Um, so what I found is interesting is there's solar companies tend to, you know, they want to be where there's transmission lines and people, which is the least popular place to build solar. So in, in my, my county, they, they were looking to acquire prime Kansas Riverland bottom ag land with irrigation rights. Well, if you would like to get all the farmers in your area mm -hmm. upset, you know, come start buying up, offer outrageous, not, you know, good, good for the guy selling, right? But you, you, you're hurting young farmers and you're, you're taking good land out of production. But impacts like, on quality or quantity? Um, none that you know of. And it's not my area of expertise. Okay. But. I'm afraid we have to get to um, questions from the public very quickly. Are there um, efforts at the state level that you would like us to know about, that you would like us to help advocate for, to help your work? And then we will turn to um, questions from the crowd. Um, I think briefly, you know, in terms of funding, it's, I think we took great strides forward in um, House Bill 2302 and uh, getting our water funding to the level that it's at. However, you know, based on studies that have been done through the Blue Urban Task Force and um, just really being able to fully implement our water vision, I don't think that we have invest, invested enough in water in Kansas. I think there's much more that we still can do to help small rural towns, to help with water quality uh, and quantity, quantity initiatives across the state. So, you know, continuing to push for water funding, talking to your legislators and your elected officials about water. Um, and then it's water, uh, it's kind of um, parallel to water, but there's also a big push right now to invest more money at a state level in uh, conservation. Kansans for Conservation are a really diverse coalition of folks. Every um, That includes folks from groups such as Farm Bureau and also Sierra Club. So you get folks on both sides of uh, both sides of the issue who see the need for conservation of existing public lands and um, you know supporting and, and uh, access to nature and things like that across Kansas that uh, this type of, of funding could really benefit uh, access to our, our beautiful state. So I think that's another great thing to talk about with your legislators. 
And, and that would be yeah. that House Bill 2541 that the Kansas for Conservation have to yes. start a conservation fund in the state. So. Yep. Any final thoughts? You know, it's, it's just important to keep this conversation going. We're sort of on a, on a five-year cycle here, right? We, we put in motion, we put in a five-year sunset on our, our funding plan because, you know, we, we put in the, the programs for municipalities, we set funding levels, and, you know, we need to see how, how the Water Authority is an advisory board that makes budget recommendations that ultimately come to the legislature and then they get diced up into the various agencies. And um, it, it can be hard to track that process. But so we've got five years to say, is our current process adequate? Are we getting money where it needs to go? Is it impactful? We've invested more money than we ever have in these sort of programs. So we need to assess it, make sure it's being used wisely, take a look at our processes, and that five-year sunset will sort of be a, a natural uh, time to do that. So, uh, but it's important to not let people forget that this matters and, and keep the conversations going, and I've been happy that they've, they've continued to go. And, um, you know, about that five-year period is when we'll have the plans from the GMDs to, to see how they plan to, to extend the life of their aquifers as well. So um, we've kind of set things in motion here, so it's important to, to, to stay aware and, and study the information. There's so much more to talk about, and I appreciate you both very much. But now we are going to turn to the audience for questions here, and we have students that will come around with a microphone. Uh, please ask a short question and uh, wait for them to, to come to you. I think we have one. Thank you very much for, for all that both of you do. Um, my question is, could you give us an update on the leak that went into the water supply and what the cleanup effort and all that sort of stuff is? Doing? From Burton? Yes. So that happened, I mean, it's been a while. I think that was um, like late 20th century that that took place. And I think through various technologies that they've been able to slow the migration of the plume. So. Um, I have seen some articles suggesting that the Aquifer Storage and Recovery Project out of Wichita is actually slowing down the migration of the plume. Um, and it's not like it's moving uh, rapidly, but it is headed towards Wichita. So I think, you know, there's no alarming concern at the moment. Uh, I think there, people are aware that it's there. People who use the water are, are know that it's contaminated with, with chlorides. Um, so I think it's really just having that awareness of it and then taking the next step. And I do believe, uh, at least when we talked to the GMD last, they have announced a partnership with the water office to meet, study uh, what a large scale remediation project will look like and then start coming up with some funding uh, numbers so that we can take a look at that as a legislature. So things are in the works to try and remediate that at, remediate that at a large scale. Uh, thanks for coming. Are uh, farmers being encouraged to adopt low-till or no-till practices to uh, mitigate sedimentation in our uh, rivers and reservoirs? Yeah, th that's pretty common practice in, in most parts of the state. And there are additional programs, especially in those like uh, buffer areas where there's runoff going into streams to put natural vegetation back in there and drain tiles and, and filters and things like that. So um, that's, I, I wouldn't have numbers, but that's pretty common practice to, to be in that sort of operation now. Although there is a pesticide trade-off that when, when you, you move to that as well. So it's, it's not, it's good for water in the ground, but there are some trade-offs over time as well. I would say I think it is far much more adopted in western Kansas than it is in our neighborhood. We have a lot of work to do, um, and soil health practices overall include not just no-till, but also adding cover crops, mm -hmm. grazing, um, less disturbance and less pesticides overall. We have a lot of work to do in that field. Another question? Um, can I hold it? Um, I was listening to you guys, and a lot of time you were talking about surface water instead of groundwater. When you talk about reservoirs, that's surface water, and I wanted to be sure that people know that. The other thing is when you talk about pollution in the lakes and from uh, sediment, from fertilizers, from um, pesticides, that also comes from cities. Mm -hmm. I know because I was an MPS coordinator here in Lawrence for a number of years. So, I mean, just don't put it on agriculture, because agriculture also, they, they um, do soil testing. Can we ask now, a question? I don't know how many people in town 
does so soil testing. They just put fertilizer on. The rest of it washes off if it's too much. So it's just not agriculture. Then the other thing was that the question I have is, you talked about uranium and the water coming down the Arkansas River mm -hmm. from Colorado. Does that go through the um, wind turbine areas up there? Because we know that um, when you put in a wind turbine, you're going 60 feet down into the ground to support those turbines. And that can go through shale. When that goes through the shale and you have rain, then that goes down can into the water. Can you ask a question, please? So my question was, is this area where the um, Arkansas River comes through, is it um, going through wind turbine areas? Because there are turbines out there. And the other thing was Barber County in Kansas has um, more PFOAs in their water now since 2012 when um, they put a big wind turbine uh, facility out there. So, Do you mind? I'll, I'll rephrase the question, uh, which was one that we asked earlier, is are there uh, known um, impacts to water quality or quantity from wind installations. And we have a 20-year history yeah. of these in Kansas, so uh, if this isn't your area yeah. of expertise, we actually have a room full of geologists that could possibly answer and that. And I don't think words. any of the major uh, wind fields are right near the arc. They're all farther south or, or northeast, so I don't think they're close enough to, to where we have contaminated water. And you know, Don't let the other 49 states win either. You can call it the Arc Kansas River. We're in Kansas. <laughs> But yes, thank you for your comments. Urban runoff is definitely a contributor to um, water quality as well in terms of non-point source pollution, something that, um, you know, is part of that equation. And yeah, in terms of uh, the Arc River, I, as far as I am aware, it has more to do with the fact that um, a lot of the folks in, in southeast, Can or southeast Colorado um, still use flood irrigation uh, just based on their uh, the way that their, their uh, land has is worked and um, kind of the historical irrigation practices in the area. So I think it has more to do with flood irrigation and um, in, in the way that interacts with the shales and the fact that it's, um, you know, not flowing through the river system or the, the surface water system. Any questions towards the back? We have one. Go ahead. I was wondering if there is any possibility of getting the people that raise corn out in western Kansas, which needs a lot of irrigation, to be not raising that there, but to have other crops. Let Iowa have the corn and give us, you know, <laughs> crops that don't need all this water. It just seems to me like it's a little backwards or upside down. Thank you. Can we talk about that transition? Yeah, I mean, folks, folks work on that. It's just a matter of what, what, what are the profit margins and, and who are the customers. And it's a, you know, if, if you look at the areas, especially in the northwest part of the state, where they've made a concerted effort to, to use less water, you do get different crop rotations. Um, in the south central part of the state, um, you can use less water and still grow the corn like you need to. And it depends on soil types and things like that. Um, but if you want to put the investment in, you can, you can maintain what you're doing, at least maintain your profit margin by reducing water use. There's technology that allows that, depending on how, how sophisticated your operation is. And, and yeah, different crop rotations can come in. And that, that's part of a bigger you know, farm operation question that, that it really comes down to the individual level. It's, that's where, the way I always explain it is, that's where we take the beautiful and terrifying maps KGS puts together here. We send them over to Manhattan and let research and extension go out and talk about that and bring that down to, to farm level economics with people. Uh, but it is a good question, and I do think it's something that I've heard folks talk about in western Kansas. And part of that is because we do see higher rates of recharge of the aquifer uh, north of, in states north of Kansas, so places like Nebraska um, and, um, and, and further north, they do have higher rates of recharge. So if, if we can get more of our corn from places such as Nebraska and, and um, incentivize switching to things like forage, uh, is that a possible way to save water? Maybe. Uh, and I think that also comes down to uh, the importance of improving our rail system, uh, because when we talk about getting this corn to farm operations in western Kansas, that means improving our short line system. So, which I know we've had some pretty significant investments in that at a state level recently, but I think 
that also emphasizes the importance of that transportation aspect also. I think there was another in the back I saw. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for all your insights, especially as a Coloradan on the water from Colorado. Um, but I'm curious as to the reliance on surface water um, is interesting to me with the Kansas River and other such rivers. How do we ensure that legislation, government agencies, and local organizations work for the environment and the people and do not become tools of outside political agendas? Are you more worried about quality or quantity concerns or in that? Um, yeah, that's a big question. So, I, I mean, I think part of my perspective all along, and we did, we've talked a little bit about reorganization, which this is more at a, an agency level. Um, but I think from my perspective right now, all of the agencies and organizations in our government that advocate for water and the environment are very, in my mind, somewhat intentionally spread out. So it gives them less of a voice in advocating um, and properly funding and, and prioritizing those issues. So I think one step towards making sure that we have some institutional security around um, sustaining these resources is looking at something like reorganization where you know, right now we have Division of Water Resources and Division of Conservation in the Department of Agriculture, which in my mind, which we might disagree on this, is also a conflict of interest. And then you have the water office, which is completely separate, and you have all of our water quality folks in the um, Kansas Department of Health and Environment. So all these groups that you know work in a similar space are spread out. And I think if we were to create a department of water and environment, then you get all those folks in the same place. And not only that, but then you have, um, you have a secretary of that department that sits at the cabinet level and is able to, to advocate for those issues, which is not something that we have right now. I do uh, applaud the governor for recently creating the natural resource, uh, the sub cabinet on natural resources, which I think brings a lot of those voices together uh, at the cabinet level. But I think that's one way to create that kind of institutional knowledge and um, to bring all of those those uh, agency folks together to make sure that, that that water and environmental issues continue to be prioritized. So that's kind of a, a higher level answer. Um, but I think that's one step that we can take in the right direction to achieve that. Senator Titus, did you want to add anything? It's, it's a big question. Uh, I, I think we have good professional staff at our agency levels, having been some of that staff for a time and, and working with other agencies. Um, you know, there's always going to be politics at play, but we as a legislator have a duty to set out, you know, clear goals and objectives for agencies. And then to some degree, we have to trust the, the staff there to, to carry those out. Um, and, and make sure our, our voices are heard when, when we're dealing with the cabinet secretaries, administrations. Some of the, the issues will filter down from the federal level where when you get funding, if you're operating a federally funded program, but um, there's a clear political bias behind some of those requirements and you have to check A, B, and C in order to carry out this state level duty that your state may or may not like, right? And then you swing the pendulum the other way and it's the same thing. So you have to be careful, you know, with, with programs and funding sources. Um, but in, in Kansas, it's a small enough group of people that it's easier to stay on top of it. But um, yeah, we have to be clear as legislators what the intent is and, and then, you know, vote for good people. I think we had one in front here. Yes. Uh, my name is Steve Cadu, and I've got a two-part question. Uh, how, uh, here in Lawrence, we have the Haskell Indian Nation University, a school for Native Americans from throughout the United States. It's, it's, a, it's an Indian university that was established in 1884, and it's the so-called flagship of Indian education in America. My two-part question, my first question is, how can Haskell get benefit uh, from the uh, water resources uh, that uh, exist here, here uh, in Kansas, uh, in, in 
mainly in the regional area. The qu first question is, how can Haskell tap into that, if you will? How can Haskell get benefit of water resources? My, my second question is, I'm, I'm uh, a leader, if you will, of an ad hoc committee for USD 497, the school district here in Lawrence, and we're developing a uh, indigenous curriculum for K through 12. We'll be one of the first in the nation. Uh, could is, is the, who in the uh, Kansas Water Program? Do, do you interact with uh, 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 K through 12 public school education curriculum and 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 education at all? So those are those are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I so for in regards to your last question for K through 12 education, I do know. Um, well, we don't, so, sorry, organizing my thoughts. Um, we don't, we are not necessarily involved with curriculum. That'll be the State Board of Education. But I do know that the Water Office, one of their key priorities is doing education around water issues in Kansas. So I think um, with a local school board, that could be a great opportunity for partnership. If you wanted to reach out to the Water Office or we could encourage them to reach out to you all and talk about ways um, to kind of share information about water in Kansas and you know water saving practices and things like that that could be implemented. I think you know education is something they really want to expand, and, and that seems like it could be an exciting partnership potentially. Um, and in, in terms of Haskell, uh, it, I'm thinking that Haskell has some land. Is am I correct some in wetlands. that? Yes. Yes. I, I, so I think I mean potentially they would be eligible uh, based on their. Uh, groundwater and surface water supplies if they wanted to do some sort of water related project to apply for state grants in order to do that. So the water office also has um, grants that they run that Haskell would potentially be eligible for. So that could be a great way for Haskell to get access to those resources too. That's great, thank you. We'll probably take two more questions. I think we have one here in the middle. And I was surprised to see that $7 million was allocated to um, landowners around that area to help them um, when Quivira actually has senior water rights. So can you give us a few comments on that uh, concern and um, litigation? Sure, so, so for folks that don't know, just briefly, you have Quivira National Wildlife Refuge, which is kind of a big marshy swamp pond area that's saltwater, important in the central flyover. Um, Rattlesnake Creek runs to it from somewhere up the edge of Ford County on down through Stafford County. And uh, it's a, an intensely developed agricultural area, lots of groundwater pumping. And what we found is uh, people pump their wells and it intercepts water before it would naturally flow through the ground into the stream. But by sort of happenstance of how groundwater developed in time, the federal refuge has a 1957 dated water right. Most of the irrigation started developing late 60s into the, on into the 70s, maybe even early 80s. So most of these groundwater pumpers are now junior water rights and they're impairing the refuge per report of the chief engineer. Um, as to the, and so that this has been an ongoing, it's been a 30, 30 year discussion to try and make sure the refuge gets enough water without uh, too much of an impact on the, the area of farmers and the, the ag economy. Um, to the seven million, that was actually a decision of the water office, I believe. Um, so you would have to pin down the director in Topeka to, to see the, the thinking, but they did allocate, of our first round of increased funding, they put seven million dollars. Now, it won't, how that will be used is still undetermined. I understand it was, it was placed in the Department of Agriculture and it's available to help with the impairment. Um, certainly pieces of that will go into the existing conservation programs to retire water right. Um, some of it may go into some staff support. I, I don't believe it's, it's been fully allocated. I, we did, you'll see a, a bill on the water bank where we did request some of those funds be used to study the water bank's impact with an independent study that we can talk about at some point. But, um, but yeah, that was really a water office decision as, as part of their their authority. I have mixed feelings about that. We'll see how they how they allocate it. Yeah, and I think 
Hello, Senator, by the way. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I think it's an interesting question, too, because it, it kind of goes to the heart of a lot of these groundwater issues where the state does have some fault. We overappropriated these rights. So the question becomes, who then bears the responsibility of reducing this use? And, and also, what is that relationship? Because you know, farmers don't want the state to come in and just fix the problem and, and shut off their wells and take away their rights, because that's not you know, fair, really. But then on the other side, um, you, know, you have farmers who um, may, be less, may not be super interested in conservation or may not be interested in, in some of these methods to do community-based uh, reductions in water use. So it kind of creates this conflict where we all know that we need to use less water, but then we have to balance how we work together to accomplish that. And some of that I think is state support because we are at fault in this too. You know, there, I think we are all in a way, I mean, blame is a strong word, but I think we're all to blame and we're also all part of the solution. And I think, you know, what the state can do to help, it should do to help. And I think what landowners can do to come together and create locally based solutions, I think is also really important for our path forward. So I think it, it's a great example of, you know, it, it's created this, um, this conflict or this tension and, and the only way to work through that is to work through it together. And I think the state has an important role to play and, and so do local people. Take one final question. Do we have one? We have one up front here. Oh, sorry. I didn't. I think Braden's coming around. Thank you. I, I understand the state has somewhat of a surplus financially. And yet at the same time, we say water is a high priority. Mm -hmm. I'm confused because it doesn't seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. If you have the money and, uh, for example, the conservation programs and the farm bill, uh, more people apply it and don't get the money, and yet the money is available from maybe state and federal. So what do we need to do really be honest about water being a high priority? Water's life. So how do you see, uh, what's our path to do that? Uh, it can't be five years, it needs to be three years. Thank you. Mic drop. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I can, I'll start on that. So I, you know, I think what we accomplished last year is a great step in the right direction. I mean, prior to 2302, it was, I mean, it was shameful how much of a pittance we were giving to water every year. I mean, we had a statutory requirement to do 8 million. That wasn't even fully funded until, um, what was it, 2020, 2021? So for far too long, it hasn't been a priority. And so I think that's what has been so hopeful about this process is that even with the failure of the really large water bill that happened three years ago, you know, that, as Kenny was saying, it raised the priority in the awareness of water issues in Kansas. And then we came back the next year and sat down at the table with the stakeholders and built a coalition and said, what can we get done? And then we passed, you know, an additional um, 35 million in funding. And so I, I think we are taking steps in the right direction. I, I completely agree that we're not doing enough. And I think there's there's a lot of room to do more. Um, so I'm very supportive of, of putting more money into water um, because it, w the amount we're investing is not only you know, small um, historically, but it's also very small compared to other states. So you have states like the Dakotas and Colorado that invest hundreds of millions in water programs and projects every single year. And right now with the 8 million, we're uh, the 8 million original plus the 35 million, it's at 43? million a year, thereabouts. So, I mean, still a fraction of what we need to be doing, but, but headed in the right direction. So I have hope. I think that people are, are becoming really informed. Legislators are becoming informed about the importance of this issue. I think it's huge progress that we have a water committee and that, you know, um, that it has been a really bipartisan process. And that gives me hope that we can continue to do more. I appreciate the sentiment of your comments. It's a complicated issue, though. Um, we have money now. We won't always have money, whether we spend it or give it back to taxpayers. And if you go back a few years when we're cutting budgets, water just struggles for a place at the table um, compared to roads and health care and education and 
Um, that's just the reality of, of budgeting in Topeka. And everything costs more. So um, the other thing that I would urge you to think about is, you know, there are a lot of good projects we could spend money on, but there does become a saturation point with groundwater where more money doesn't really make people use less groundwater. And if that's one of our, you know, I always say our two priorities are the groundwater declines and, and reservoir space. And for the groundwater one, yeah, you can get irrigation technology out there. We can make sure the Division of Water Resources has the staff they need to get conservation plans in place and all of those things. But, but there's a saturation point. Um, and I don't know where that is, but um, we'll hit that. And then it really just becomes, you know, people making individual choices. And the state, that's not an area where the state typically can buy the choices that some people may or may not want. So. Um, it's complicated and, and there's a lot of demands for money, but the fact that we've carved out this much, I think we need to be appreciative of where we've gotten. These have been great conversations and great questions. I appreciate everybody for participating in it. I wish we could keep going, but we have come to an end. Um, I do hope that people will come back for our next two conversations in this series about energy and climate change. Um, I would like to thank uh, Braden Bangalin, who's been a uh, part of the one of the students really helping to formulate this program, and also Rachel Creighton, who can't be with us tonight. And if you'd join me in thanking one final time our speakers. Thank you, everyone.